The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the first chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And he went a little farther. He saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat mending their nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. <clears throat> Drop your nets and follow me. Jesus' call to the disciples was direct and simple, follow me and I will make you fishers of people. A simple request, but with grave consequences. Drop your nets and follow me. What does Jesus mean here? I mean, what are the implications of his request? In the Gospels, it becomes clear that this is a call to gather people for God's kingdom. It's a call that authorizes them to be representatives of their teacher, to be agents of God's love. Drop your nets and follow me. And we typically read this text as a call for evangelism, but it's also a call for repentance. Repent means to turn back towards God, for we have turned away. It's a call for us to look at what we're holding on to, to look at our nets, to look at what we are holding on to that makes it so hard for us to fully follow Jesus, to give our all to God. Drop your nets. Gosh, it sounds so easy when you say it out loud. Just drop it, right? Give up whatever is holding you back. But it hasn't been that simple for us because it also means dropping worldly teaching, worldly life to pick up something new, to pick up the love known in Jesus Christ, to live a sacrificial life. For the disciples to drop their nets, they were dropping their living, their worldviews, their biases to walk a new life, to walk a road that leads to death, that leads to the cross. As Paul once said in Philippians, to live is Christ and to die is gain. A simple request, but with grave consequences. And if we were honest with ourselves and our communities, how often do we actually drop our nets, drop our comforts, drop our worldly ways of living for God's higher calling, to fulfill God's dream? Especially when we consider the cost of the calling. Throughout human history, God has sent people to open our eyes to the real cost of our sin, the cost of holding on to nets, nets that we should have never picked up in the first place, but ones we have nevertheless inherited. And I've been thinking of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. because we celebrated MLK Day last week. I watched as my Facebook and Instagram feed flooded with quotes by him all about love and community, the quotes that make us feel good about ourselves. But if we're really honest about who he was, he was one of the most hated men in America at the time, in our country, because of what he said, because of what he stood for. He pointed out Jesus, and he pointed out evil. Dr. Sit King saw what the cost was to our humanity when we hold on to our nets. 
He experienced the cost of being oppressed and disenfranchised. He experienced the nets of hate, the nets of racism, the nets of injustice being cast out into the world, into the very depths of our society. And Dr. King saw the cost. A whole movement of people saw the cost, not only for the oppressed, but also for the privileged not only for the black community, but also for the white, not only for the poor, but for the rich, not only for the rural, but for the urban. The cost affects us all. But he also saw what would come with following the way of Christ, of dropping those nets, of loving God and loving neighbor. He saw the way for liberation, liberation for all, and became an agent of God's love of justice. In King's acceptance speech of the Nobel Peace Prize, he said this, quote, I believe that unarmed truth and unconditional love will have the final word in reality. This is why right temporarily defeated is stronger than evil triumphant. I believe that even amidst today's mortar bursts and whining bullets, there is still hope for a brighter tomorrow. I believe that wounded justice lying prostrate on the blood flowing streets of our nations can be lifted from this dust of shame to reign supreme among the children of men. I have the audacity to believe that peoples everywhere can have three meals a day for their bodies, education, and culture for their minds, and dignity, equality, and freedom for their spirits. I believe that what self-centered men have torn down, men other-centered can build up." End quote. And we, too, believe what King believed, that following God's way is the way to freedom, to justice, to liberty for all. It means looking, really looking at ourselves and what holds us back. All of us are held slave to the sin of white nationalism, white supremacy, and capitalism. All of us are held captive to the economy of sin. The poor keep getting poorer, and the rich keep getting richer, and people keep dying, and children keep hurting, and enough is enough is enough. And Jesus calls us to drop our nets and follow him. The disciples left their nets and followed. King left his net and followed. And not only did they follow, but they embraced their neighbor so that we too could follow. See, this call is not just about us as an individual, but us as a community. We are interconnected. Discipleship is not a solo endeavor, but a communitive calling. As King noted, Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. There is a symbiotic relationship that exists between us and our neighbor, not only to survive, but to thrive. So if we have forgotten our neighbor in the midst of our own success, are we truly following Christ? Such a way of living, some would say, is too extreme, that is too selfless, that is too costly. In his letter from Birmingham jail, Dr. King addresses such questions. King writes, quote, was not Jesus an extremist for love? Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Was not Amos an extremist for justice? Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Was not Paul an extremist for the Christian gospel? I bear in my body the Mars of the Lord Jesus Christ. Was not Martin Luther an extremist? Here I stand, I can do no other, so help me God. End quote. 
So the question is not whether we will be extremists, but what kind of extremists we will be. Will we be extremists for hate or will we be extremists for love? Will we be extremists for the preservation of injustice or will we be extremists for the cause of justice? Drop your nets and follow me. A simple request, but with grave consequences. This last week, we celebrated God working through the legacy of Dr. King, not just to celebrate one man and his work 50 years ago, but the ongoing work of the Spirit through those influenced and challenged and pushed because of the work in the civil rights movement. That which is started has yet to be finished. King's dream, not yet fully realized. And yet... God's spirit does not stop. God's dreams are still to be realized. God's justice will find its way in this world. That which inspired the first disciples to drop their nets, inspired Dr. King to drop his nets, inspires us to do the same. May you, like the disciples, drop your nets and follow May you, like Dr. King, believe in unconditional love. And may you, with the Holy Spirit, do the work that needs to be done today, tomorrow, and always. Amen.